Hello, welcome to the A Book A Day channel. Today, I'm going to interpret a classic work for you titled The Origins of Political Order, written by the Japanese-American political scientist Francis Fukuyama. Many people are familiar with Fukuyama's name because in 1989 he proposed the End of History Thesis, which caused quite a sensation at the time. The End of History Thesis, in simple terms, suggests that liberal democracy is the ultimate form of human government. You may have also heard that Fukuyama himself has abandoned the idea of the end of history, and this book, The Origins of Political Order, expresses his new thoughts after this change in stance. However, today I want to tell you that these statements are all incorrect. I believe that Fukuyama's fundamental academic position has not fundamentally changed in the past 30 years. What's more important is that his ideas remain relevant for understanding the modern world we live in today. This is because Fukuyama possesses a rare ambition among contemporary scholars. He dares to tackle a long-standing and challenging question in political science, which is the future of human politics. This may be one of the biggest and most difficult questions in world politics. The current global situation is filled with conflicts and disputes, and most people have lost confidence in the idea of shared values and believe that a harmonious world is an unrealistic utopia. The majority of contemporary thinkers either avoid controversies between universality and particularity or doubt the political ideas of universalism. In such an environment, Fukuyama truly stands out as one of the few scholars who supports universalism. His fundamental viewpoint can be summarized as the convergence of the development of human politics. Fukuyama's theory has sparked much controversy and may be flawed. However, before making a judgment of right or wrong, we first need to understand what Fukuyama's viewpoint actually is. In today's interpretation, I will divide it into three parts to help you understand his perspective. First, why did Fukuyama write this book? This will address his problem awareness. Second, what does this book discuss? This will explain the basic ideas and core viewpoints of the book. Third, how well is this book written? I will provide a brief evaluation of his ideas for you. All right, let's begin. In fact, Fukuyama has published two works discussing political order, which can be seen as two volumes. The first volume is the one we're going to talk about today titled The Origins of Political Order, published in 2011. Three years later, he released the second volume, Political Order and Political Decay. Both of these books have an English version that spans over 600 pages, covering the human political history from prehistoric times to the present day, making them monumental works. Why did Fukuyama exert so much effort in studying the origins and development of political order? There are two direct reasons. The first reason comes from Fukuyama himself. He observed an important change in world politics in the 21st century, namely the reversal of the trend toward democratization. This change posed a challenge to Fukuyama's previous notion of the end of history. From the early 1970s to the late 1990s, the number of liberal democratic countries in the world increased from around 40 to over 120 known as the third wave of democratization. However, in the first decade of the 21st century, a democratic recession occurred. Approximately one-fifth of the countries that experienced the third wave of democratization either reverted to authoritarian regimes or suffered severe erosion of their democratic institutions. After the 9-11 attacks in 2001, the United States launched two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, achieving military victories quickly. However, the post-war reconstruction efforts faced serious challenges, and the attempt to export democratic systems became increasingly difficult. Fukuyama himself participated in some international development projects and witnessed many countries experiencing governance failures. For example, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Haiti, East Timor, and Papua New Guinea were effectively operating at the level of tribal politics, with each tribe controlled by a leader. These countries experienced frequent tribal conflicts, social disorder, and poor governance, making it difficult for international aid to reach the ordinary people. This strongly emphasized to Fukuyama the importance of state capacity. In other words, when a country severely lacks governance capacity, partisan competition, and democratic elections are essentially ineffective. The second reason why Fukuyama was determined to study political order was inspired by his mentor, Huntington. Huntington was Fukuyama's professor during his doctoral studies at Harvard University. The two of them put forward contrasting viewpoints, the clash of civilizations and the end of history, respectively, which dominated Western intellectual discourse in the decade after the Cold War. I have covered this topic in the 38th lecture of my 40 lectures on Western Modern Thought course. Fukuyama once published a sharp critique of Huntington's clash of civilizations theory, which led to a strained relationship between the two and they did not interact for many years. It was only three years before Huntington's death that they reconciled, and Huntington entrusted Fukuyama to write an introduction for the 2006 edition of his book, Political Order and Changing Societies. As a result, Fukuyama reread Huntington's influential work, which was first published in 1968. The book contains an important argument that for countries in the process of modernization, political order capacity which refers to the ability to maintain political order and governance, is more important than the question of whether a political system is democratic or non-democratic. Democracy addresses the issue of political legitimacy, but it cannot replace the capacity of a political system. 
When a country lacks sufficient capacity, democratization is not only difficult to achieve but may also lead to political turmoil. This book primarily focuses on developing countries in the mid-negative 20th century and does not explain the origins of modern political institutions or the phenomena of the subsequent half-century. Therefore, rereading this book both inspired Fukuyama and left him unsatisfied. This became an opportunity that sparked Fukuyama's desire to systematically study political order. It can be said that Fukuyama's two monumental works are an extension, update, and development of Huntington's work. Hence, Fukuyama states in his book that he dedicates it to his mentor, Huntington. Fukuyama's two monumental works attempt to answer the questions left by Huntington. He needed to go back to the beginning, starting from the origins, to explore the logical development of human politics. Now we enter the second part, to see what Fukuyama wrote in his book. The work is filled with numerous clues, like a dense forest, and it's easy to get lost in it. Therefore, we need to grasp the author's basic train of thought. There are two key points that I hope you can remember, which I'll refer to as the three pillars and the two forces. Let's start with the three pillars, which are the three constituent elements of modern political order, or three types of modern institutions. Think about it. When exploring the origins of political order, what does Fukuyama need to do first? He needs to clarify what political order itself is in order to delve into its origins. Therefore, Fukuyama first clarifies in a contemporary perspective what constitutes a good political order and its elements before looking back to its roots. In the contemporary world, which country represents the ideal political order? Fukuyama here borrows a sociologist statement considering Denmark as the ideal political order. What's good about Denmark? The government is clean and efficient, society is democratic, stable, and prosperous, people cherish peace, freedom, and inclusiveness. This is certainly desirable and almost a goal that everyone aspires to. Fukuyama uses Denmark as a specimen for analysis and identifies three elements that constitute a good political order, the state, the rule of law, and accountability. Let me briefly explain each of them. First is the state, which is the exercise of governing functions through centralized power. These functions include taxation, maintaining social order and national security, and providing basic social public goods. Second is the rule of law. It is not laws made by rulers themselves but a set of universally recognized rules that are supreme and apply to everyone including rulers. The rule of law imposes limits on power, distinguishing between legitimate use of power and its illegitimate abuse. Third is accountable government. Here, accountable refers to the government's obligation to respond to inquiries, thus assuming responsibility for the public welfare and restraining the pursuit of personal interests. These three elements are the three pillars of political order, as described by Fukuyama. The state embodies power, the rule of law and accountability are limitations, and constraints on governing power. After clarifying the three pillars, Fukuyama starts from ancient times and explores the origins and development of political order. Humans are inherently social animals. In the state of nature in ancient times, there existed a form of order within groups, but this order was very simple, and the size of the groups was small. So, how did humans develop advanced political order on a large scale from simple and primitive rules? Fukuyama believes that the development of political order is similar to biological evolution. It is also an evolutionary process. So what is the logic behind the evolution of political order? It is the struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, and the advantage of the characteristics that are best adapted to the environment. However, political evolution is different from biological evolution. Biological evolution relies on genetic mutation while institutions can be designed and selected by humans. Moreover, institutions cannot be perpetuated through genes but rather through cultural transmission, which although stable, is more susceptible to change compared to biology. Therefore, human biological characteristics can remain relatively unchanged over tens of thousands of years, while political institutions, when faced with significant environmental pressures, can undergo significant changes within decades or even years. So, what drives the development and evolution of political institutions? The answer is rather complex, but I will simplify it as the struggle between two forces. One force is what Fukuyama calls patrimonialism, which is the natural inclination to favor family and friends. It mainly arises from the biological instinct of kin selection favoring groups of people who are genetically similar or closely related. Patrimonialism is beneficial for close cooperation within small-scale groups, but is not conducive to the complex social order beyond tribal levels. The other force can be referred to as expanded cooperation, although this is not a concept Fukuyama himself used. It encapsulates his insights. It refers to the ability of humans to transcend kinship relations and engage in complex and effective social cooperation. The force of expanded cooperation also has a basis in biological instincts, including nonkin reciprocal altruism, abstract thinking, adherence to rules, and the pursuit of recognition. However, this force has surpassed simple biological instincts and represents a cultural capacity unique to humans. With these two forces defined, we can summarize Fukuyama's overall perspective in a simple sentence. Political order originated from patrimonialism. 
and the history of the evolution of political order is the history of the continuous struggle between patrimonialism and expanded cooperation. The development of modern political order, including the emergence of the state, the rule of law, and accountable government, represents the achievement of expanded cooperation overcoming the force of patrimonialism. By grasping Fukuyama's basic train of thought, it becomes easier to understand the three pillars he mentioned earlier, which are how the three types of modern political institutions emerged. Let's start with the state. Fukuyama believes that China established the first modern state in human history during the Qin Dynasty. You might wonder isn't the Qin Dynasty ancient? How can it be a modern state? Please note that when Fukuyama refers to modern, he is not referring to the time frame but rather the type of state. A modern state is one that governs through a depersonalized bureaucratic system, where personal characteristics and relationships are disregarded, and only competence and capability matter. This is what the Chinese refer to as a point in the virtuous. Was China able to establish a modern state system first? Fukuyama believes it was because of warfare. During the Warring States period, which lasted for over 450 years, countless wars were fought. Under the pressures of life and death, the higher the level of a state's conscription, taxation, supply, and organizational coordination, the greater is military advantage. The state of Qin recruited military and administrative talents beyond the boundaries of family blood ties, shifting from a favoring Qin approach to an appointing the virtuous approach. This enabled Qin to unify the six states in 221 BC and establish a centralized authoritarian bureaucratic state. This example demonstrates how political institutions evolve under the pressures of war. The expanded cooperation of appointing the virtuous overcame the patrimonialism of favoring Qin. Of course, throughout Chinese history, there have been many resurgences of kinship-based systems. But institutionalized expanded cooperation has continued to develop, resulting in advanced depersonalized management systems, such as the imperial examination system. On the other hand, in the West, the first modern institution to emerge was not the state but the rule of law. Fukuyama believes that the rise of the rule of law originated from religion. In ancient times, Israel had Judaism, India had Hinduism, the Middle East had Islam, and Europe had Christianity, all of which had religious laws. However, only in medieval Europe did the rule of law see significant development. At that time, secular powers in Europe were fragmented, and the Catholic Church developed an independent, hierarchical, and bureaucratic ecclesiastical system separate from secular powers. There were several factors at play. On the one hand, Christian doctrine required individuals to dedicate themselves to the church organization, which inherently resisted kinship ties. At the same time, the church granted women equal inheritance rights as men, originally to attract more property donations and promote its own interests. But in practice, it undermined the bonds of kinship, giving rise to depersonalized governance through the rule of law within the church organization. Here, we can see that religion played a role in resisting patrimonialism through the force of expanded cooperation. Additionally, the revival of Roman law contributed to the development of mature legal codes and educational systems. Eventually, the Catholic Church established a unified legal order and judicial system in Europe. By the later Middle Ages, when European monarchies transitioned to modern nation-states, there was already a blueprint for the rule of law and the development of modern state systems required the constraint of the rule of law. Lastly, let's discuss accountable government. Accountable government first appeared in England, somewhat serendipitously, as a result of long-standing power struggles between the king and parliament. Ultimately, during the Glorious Revolution, the principles of accountable and representative government became institutionalized. However, at that time, accountability in England was not comprehensive. Only the nobility and emerging bourgeoisie, which accounted for less than 10% of the population, had the power to hold the king accountable. It was not until the 20th century that accountable government developed into a democratic system where all citizens had the right to vote. Finally, I would like to provide a brief assessment of Fukuyama's book. In this book, Fukuyama showcases the rich diversity of political order development worldwide. Not only are the paths diverse, but the current outcomes also appear to be diverse. This is easily explained because there are two main factors that influence the evolution of political order, human biology and the local environment in which populations exist. Humans with shared biology will naturally make different institutional choices in different environments. However, this presents a major challenge for Fukuyama. If he perfectly explains the diversity of political development, how can he explain how different political choices ultimately converge or lead to similar goals? Fukuyama has long been aware of this contradiction and has subtly laid down an argument for convergence that only careful readers will notice. In the preface, he hints that readers may feel that the narrative of this long historical process implies that societies are trapped by their own history. But in fact, we live today in very different and dynamic environments then, in chapter 1. He points out the importance of interactions between different populations, which are just as significant as the natural environment. At the end of chapter 27, he again emphasizes the three modern political systems, the three pillars mentioned earlier, and suggests that once integrated, they will form an attractive pattern for the world. What is the logic behind this argument? Human biology is a constant, while the environment is a variable. For the evolution of political order, 
The environment is not just limited to the physical geographical environment, but also includes interactions with external populations, the level of technological civilization, and the role of ideological concepts. These factors are all subject to change and exert influence on the evolution of political order as environmental pressures. Ultimately, countries that embody all three modern systems have the strongest competitive advantage in evolution. The ideal political order, such as the Danish model, will be studied and emulated, just like other desirable things. If someone argues that the environment cannot be replicated or copied, I believe Fukuyama would respond by saying, This subtle argument becomes more explicit in the second volume, Political Order and Political Decay. In the final chapter, Fukuyama summarizes, Although high-quality democratic government is sometimes in short supply, the demand for it continues to grow. This means that the political development process has a clear directionality and that accountable governments that recognize the equal dignity of citizens have universal appeal. Tolstoy said, All happy families are alike, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Fukuyama's view on political order is similar to Tolstoy's view on families, good political orders are similar, while bad political orders each have their own flaws. Furthermore, Fukuyama believes that good political order will become a common goal for humanity, and the existing diversity is merely a process of convergence. I must remind you that Fukuyama's overall perspective on human politics may not necessarily be correct, but he is a serious scholar. He did not hastily propose the end of history theory simply because he saw the West winning the Cold War. Initially, he presented this theory in a speech at the University of Chicago in 1988, at a time when no one would have believed that the Cold War could soon come to an end. The revised version of his speech, The End of History, was published in the summer of 1989. A few months later, political upheavals occurred in Eastern Europe followed by the dissolution of the Soviet Union two years later. As a result, Fukuyama gained fame and was even regarded as a prophet of thought. In other words, Fukuyama began his intellectual journey with a minority viewpoint. Over the following 30 years, the world underwent significant changes, and the focus of Fukuyama's attention did indeed shift, and his thinking also developed. He placed greater emphasis on and gained a deeper understanding of the meaning of political order and its evolution. However, Fukuyama never abandoned or fundamentally altered his basic stance, as many people wrongly assume. During the period when Western democratic systems faced serious challenges, he repeatedly emphasized that the fundamental idea of the end of history remains essentially correct and insisted that liberal democracy as a political concept has no real competitors 30 years later. Fukuyama finds himself back in the position of a minority. So, stepping outside of this book, is Fukuyama's notion of convergence mistaken? The current global situation is not favorable to Fukuyama, as the prevailing trend appears to be one of division rather than convergence. Brexit in the UK, American retrenchment, the rise of economic and political nationalism, separatism, surges in anti-immigration and xenophobia, escalating trade disputes, and the decline of globalization. Indeed, over the past decade, we have witnessed a shift in the direction of history, with division and fragmentation becoming dominant, and the common goals of humanity seemingly fading away. However, the prevailing winds of the time are not reliable guides for historical judgment. Let's go back to 1991. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Germany was reunified. The European Council adopted the Treaty on European Union. Nelson Mandela was released and embarked on political efforts for peace and reconciliation in South Africa. And the United States liberated Kuwait from Iraq's occupation in the Gulf War. Former U.S. President George H.W. Bush subsequently declared in his State of the Union address that these changes in 1991 were almost biblical in scale. Will the current trend be more lasting than the trend of the late 20th and early 21st centuries? In other words, if Fukuyama's prediction of the end of history did not materialize then, is it now more credible to assert the end of the free order? What lies ahead for human politics? In my opinion, this big question will persist in the long term, and Fukuyama's response will also experience periods of revival and decline and during the test of reality. All right, that's all for the origins of political order. This book contains a wealth of historical narratives, cross-cultural comparisons, and theoretical explanations. You need to read it yourself to appreciate its brilliance and depth. The Origins of Political Order actually discusses the origins of modern political order. In other words, the three institutions of modern statehood, the rule of law, and accountability originated separately before the 17th century. It was only after the 19th century that they gradually converged and combined in many countries. Fukuyama has a deep belief that the ideal modern political order is achieved by integrating the three pillars he proposed, the state, rule of law, and accountability. His reasoning is simple, a state without power is weak and ineffectual, but unlimited power is dangerous. Therefore, the key to the three pillars is to find the right balance between weakness and omnipotence. This is the ideal goal of political order and the symbolic significance of Denmark that Fukuyama sees. But for many countries, becoming Denmark is not an easy task. How can Iraq, Afghanistan, or Somalia become like Denmark? Fukuyama, during his tenure as a visiting professor at a university in Denmark, discovered that even the Danes themselves do not know how today's Denmark was created. 
Fukuyama concluded that contemporary Westerners suffer from historical amnesia and have forgotten the origins and development of liberal democratic institutions. That's why he decided to write this book to rebuild our memory of history. All right, that's the entire content of this video. Congratulations on completing another book. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next episode.